So another set of realizations concerning Titan are available using this theory, as well as I place Titan on the WT diagram. Uh, <laughs> I make a massive adjustment because I'm starting to draw a bead on this thing where it's actually located on the diagram, even though the diagram doesn't have mass yet. But look right about there. I linked the, this new updated version of this Victor paper, but it's right before Ocean World stages, or Ocean World phase curve, I should say, so it probably does have lots of water. And its interior, as modeled by NASA from the Cassini mission, is quite interesting. You have um, organic rich atmosphere and surface, decoupled outer shell, which is water ice, cal calthrate, I don't know, I'm not sure what that is. Global subsurface ocean, high pressure ice, VI shell, and hydrosilicate core, 2,000 kilometer radius. Now you notice there's no iron core in there. And what's important about this theory and why that's important in particular is because we can actually even place Titan as being, uh, as having evolved too fast to form an iron core. Meaning the iron cord objects are up higher on that on a phase curve, so an iron core cord object would be like we're, we're closer to where that purple line is, where the Taylor threshold is. As well, we can also tell from this that Titan's age. Of course, I took uh, I I linked this paper, the DH ratios, uh, the DH ratio in methane and Titan uh, origin and history. Icarus in 2002. I, <laughs> I did a, uh, I did a cutout on the web page and just posted it on there. Gives more of a uh, in your face. This is exactly where I found it. I'm not making this stuff up. The DH ratio, uh, using this theory as well. Um, 7.75 plus or minus 2.25, 10 to the negative five, and then 8.75. And those values right there, I set those to uh, 1 over 6,250, just like my earlier papers. And I came up with Titan being, with that measurement, 2.17 plus or minus 0.633 billion years old. Or 2.46 plus 0.914 or minus 0.633 billion years old. And that's, that's fitting because, yeah... That's where Titan would fit, right there. Um, it's not going to be able to ever form life, but it does have, as the NASA diagram from Cassini pointed out, organic molecules. And the reason why it has organic molecules isn't because life was there. It's because organic material forms absent life. Um, it's a biogenic. Fossil fuels fossil fuels such as natural gas, oil, uh, long chain hydrocarbons are natural and abiogenic. They're not, life isn't required to form them. But coal, on the other hand, is, yeah, compressed organic matter over long periods of time. But those aren't composed of extremely long hydrocarbon chains. Those are a mishmash of carbon and other types of uh, elements, such as phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, oxygen. They're not long hydrocarbon chains where there's a backbone of carbon atoms and there's hydrogens that are on each side. Those are formed naturally inside the atmospheres of stars as they cool and evolve. Um, as well, Titan being right there shows us that this object evolved really fast. Um, but it is actually, it's, it's about twice, it's, Earth is about twice as old as Titan. As well, Titan is, well, with Saturn, like 590 million years old. It's basically four times older than the object that it orbits, Saturn. So what this means is if Saturn moves up on the diagram, of course this is outlined in the paper. If Saturn moves up in the diagram, I don't have Saturn on here, but it moves up just a little bit say by about a billion years, it no longer exists. It's already 
a billion years completely encompasses all of Saturn's existence. But Titan would still be there. If Titan was 2.17 year, billion years old, you take a billion years away, boom. Titan was, when, when Saturn, before Saturn even existed a billion years ago, Titan was a gray dwarf. Uh, there was on a phase curve where it was just starting to get ripped apart. So imagine the transformation curve uh, drawing upwards like this. I didn't, I didn't put a transformation curve on there. But basically, you can infer from it that Titan had been orbiting really close to a much hotter star that ripped its outer atmosphere away, and it couldn't even form an iron core. It just evolved way, 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 way too fast. It didn't have enough uh, time for the material that it was collecting in outer space to collect in the center, like a lot of stars do. A lot of stars, when they wander outer space, they can collect a lot of uh, heavy iron which then sinks to the center, forming the core. But Titan didn't have a lot of that time. It got, in its atmosphere, it got ripped away, so it didn't have a lot of surface area to collect all, a lot of the material. Um, let's see what else here. <clears throat> and Titan is also less massive than Mars. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to make, I'm trying to figure out where the mass, the, the masses will fit. So if you notice, Titan is right here, and Mars is right here. So it's a little bit lower. Um, I probably have to stick Mars up a little bit higher as well with the others. Um, maybe even move the gra graph a little bit, but that's not important for right now. That's a lot of details. All we need to realize is that Titan, uh, its, its evolutionary time frame is a lot younger than I had originally had it as. I originally had Titan, I think, what was it, like 12, 10 to 12 billion years old. And... As we see here, that's, well, false, because the, the data that's coming in and the different methods that that haven't existed before that are existing now, such as, you know, the DH, the DH ratios being placed in the context, they just didn't exist before for me to, to appropriately place this, this, this object. And then now that I have a gyro chronology coming up, uh, I'll do a talk on that a little later. Basically, gyro chronology is if the object's spinning, it's still active. And very old stars, as the star cools and dies and collapses, it just stops spinning. I mean, it it could it can't be any more simple than that. Of course, there are going to be certain complexities involved when you have lots of mass loss or lots of mass gain uh, towards the beginning of the star's evolution. But once it hits a certain point, I'm beginning to believe that there's going to be some type of exponential or logarithmic, I should say, function for when the star reaches a certain point, say like red dwarf or brown dwarf stages, and it slowly starts losing mass and cooling and slowly stops rotating all the way down to where it reaches a rotational rate, such as, you know, the Earth or, or Mars. And then Earth or Mars, their rotation rate is like once every 24 hours yet when you look at venus and mercury their rotation rate is like what 56 days or 88 days and then and 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 venus's rotation rate is like 243 days that's that's crazy but i do uh i do some more gyro chronology stuff there and as well it's suggested for for future for future listeners, for future people who want to make more sense of this, the best way to do it is to realize that these objects are independent. Uh, I, that's why that's why I put the principle of multiple evolving nebulas here, it, which says a star system or solar system is comprised of multiple evolving nebulas, some more evolved than others. Now, the whole term nebula in astronomy and astrophysics is the idea that oh it's just this diffuse thing it doesn't really do anything but that's not exactly true a, a nebula a luminous nebula is a star okay and as the star cools and collapses and it loses its luminosity and its mass and it changes form which is the metamorphosis part that nebula is going to evolve so it's best to look at Jupiter as a nebula. It's best to look at Saturn 
as a nebula. Uranus as a nebula, Neptune as a nebula. And it's even more important to look at the Earth itself in the atmosphere that we're breathing in and to remember we're breathing in an ancient nebula. That's what the atmosphere is. It's not just a bunch of uh, material that's brought here from comets. No, we're breathing in a, a really, 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 really old portion, very, very small portion of a nebula that's been around for billions of years and we're made of it, which is absolutely insane. But you gotta start looking at it like that. They're independent as well. We don't, we're just, this isn't just a big rock. This is a highly evolved structure that has leftover remains of when it was much hotter, much bigger, and much younger. And they all are. And the reason why they're different is because they have different evolutionary histories. And that's a complete, completely different worldview than what they're currently teaching astrophysics students these days. And it's also important to understand that it isn't that the dogma is bad per se. I use that word dogma, you know, but it's just to juxtapose the new worldview with that to say, oh, well, this is how we were doing things. This is how it probably is. And for you to like, look at the differences. That's why I use that word because it's not, it, it's as new. It isn't something that's been taught and repeated in people's minds over and over and over and over and over again. And nothing's changed. And, and I guess it's, it's time for a change now. I mean, we can't make sense of the exoplanet data without a new theory. And it's, it's about time that we, we got a new theory. All right, you guys, uh, today is June 16th, 2019. Later.